All right, hi everybody. My name is Paul Sargent, and we are back with AP European History. And today, uh, we're going to be taking a look at some of the changes in power that happen in the 17th century. Now, our last video took a look at changes during the Renaissance, and so now we're moving forward in time a little bit, and we kind of like like jump the Reformation here. Um, and there are a lot of politics during the Reformation, um, but, but we kind of jump over that because um, those are covered in a different uh, period. Well, um, so by jumping it, we end with the final of the Wars of Religion, the Thirty Years' War, which is a real turning point. And this is where the College Board has decided to cut off as one of its three main turning points in history, 1648. Um, and while you don't need to know a lot about the war, or really all that much about the war at all, a little background, it really starts off as being a religious war, okay? It's a religious war between Calvinists who are practicing in Bohemia and the centralized Catholic state of the Habsburgs in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and uh, really, Calvinists are practicing illegally because Calvinism wasn't recognized by the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. So the war goes through basically four phases. Um, while, they, while it makes for a very interesting story, while it's extremely destructive, and while it's very important in the course of European history, um, a P euro does not require you to know anything about any of the phases other than they happened. Now, there is, however, one thing that I should point out, because there is a change here from the beginning to the end. In the beginning, this is a religious war. And as time goes on, the, the religious lines blur. And by the end, this is a war about state power. So that you have um, Protestants siding with Catholics to fight against Catholics who also side with Protestants. So it's all about state power, and the state power really ends up being um, the, uh, the French versus um, the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburgs. Um, so the outcomes of the war, this Peace of Westphalia is, man, you need to know this date, the Peace of Westphalia of 1648. It is the end of the Holy Roman Empire, um, and its effects have been debated for a long time. Now, the of it absolutely have to do um, with, uh, with, with, with some very major things because what they do is they recognize three religions now in Germany. They dissolve the Holy Roman Empire to get all together and give power to the princes who can decide between Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism um, as their choice for their and so you can see here, like, like this is where uh, the whole thing is fought out um, with the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire, um, the holdings of the Habsburgs here, here, here. Um, uh, let's see, boy, yeah, they're just kind of all over the place um, holding on to this here, here, and all of that. Um, but you have lots and lots of different states that get involved so that this is almost a nationwide war. You also may notice, just as a little foreshadowing here, these two states here, which are showing up, called Brandenburg and Prussia. Um, we'll just call that foreshadowing, and we'll say more on this later, because they are going to uh, become a big, uh, a big part of European politics. But not yet, so we'll just kind of let it go. Also, uh, yeah, Alsace over here gets into the uh, mix at the end. And, uh, yeah, Alsace and neighboring Lorraine become uh, a bit of a, an issue. Anyway, the chronology, you know, it is, um, it, it, does, it does go on for a long time, starting with the Bohemian Revolt, um, where some Bohemians really, in the famous defenestration of Prague, throw uh, some, some uh, officials of the Holy Roman Empire out a window. Um, and you can get more on that on other videos. Um, Peace of Westphalia being, again, um, the big ending of it. It leads to a lot of destruction. Uh, it leads to a lot of uh, uh, lessons about what, what you need to do with, with armies and, and whether armies should be state-controlled or, or should they be loyal to individuals. And you find out that, that states that can harness large amounts of money and can tax efficiently 
are able to use that money to wage a war and wage a war successfully. All right. Now, there is a question of a military revolution here because there's a change which helps this power struggle move along. In order to survive here, um, these people need, these, these rulers need an effective military machine, something that can fight and work well. Gustavus Adolphus um, is one of the big reformers there, but it's this that is totally uh, important. There's a link between the military and taxes. The old military of the knights is no longer around here. And this new military is ruled by one thing, and that is gunpowder. But once you've trained people in how to use gunpowder, and once you've outfitted them and all of that, you can't just, as a, as a monarch, dissolve your army and let them all go home and farm. You have to maintain a professional force that can be ready at any time and be trained because when you're facing people who are firing gunpowder at you, you need a lot of training not to just turn around and run away. There are a series of peasant revolts um, throughout Europe that, that, that lead up to this. Um, there are problems. A lot of this has to do with pulling people together and increasing the power of the state. Um, interesting here, just, uh, you know, here it is, 2015, uh, September 29th, Catalonia that has a revolt uh, against the Spanish centralizing of authority. Well, um, they're trying to create their own state right now. So, you know, yeah, there's, I mean, some of these things still go on. Um, and then there are noble revolts in France where, where nobility is taking on, um, sort of going against the power of the rising power of the uh, of the uh, monarch, um, and these become known as the Fronde. And while they are eventually put down, Louis XIV, who's a kid when the Fronde happens, never forgets this revolt uh, against his power by the nobility and makes it like his life mission to totally subjugate the nobility. And boy, no one does it better than all right, so in Western Europe, there is a practice of absolutism. And in order to understand it, we're just going to talk about the foundations here because they're really laid um, prior to our cutoff date at 1648. And then um, they really develop after that. Um, but France is kind of like the big sort of like poster child for absolute rule. Absolutism is all about the, the uh, ruler having absolute power. And that absolute power will eventually be codified to come down as the divine right of kings. In other words, kings have no responsibility to answer to their own subjects. They only answer to God himself, and that's it. And Cardinal Richelieu, who's, who's the main advisor of Louis XIII, um, is the main, is like a guy who sets up the foundations of this whole thing, Louis XIII and the XIV as well come to the throne as children, and so therefore they need people to run the country for them until they grow up. Um, and it really has to do with weakening the challengers. They take away um, power from Huguenots and nobles, um, and, and then they strengthen the crown. And they do this through a series of intendants who go out, and they do like tax collecting and stuff like that, which used to be done by the nobility. These are bureaucrats. These are, these are an increasing middle class who are getting paid to do professional jobs for the, uh, for the king. And therefore, they have um, allegiance to this king who rules by divine right. And there's this fraud, the noble revol revolt that I was talking about, that gets put down, but that doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't ever go out of uh, Louis the Fiend. So there's Cardinal Richelieu for you, really nice, nicely dressed guy here, but yeah, um, he's sort of one of the main architects of the absolute theory. Now in England, things happen differently, um, and the story of the English constitutional monarchy um, is, is one that is um, a very interesting story, but it's also one that is a cautionary tale at the time for the rest of Europe, because the monarchs don't want to be in this situation that the English kings find themselves in. So it starts with King James I. Now Elizabeth I dies with no heir, and so the closest royal heir is King James VI of Scotland, who ironically is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who Elizabeth had killed. 
he's the closest relative when she dies, and so he's asked, he's offered uh, the throne. He comes down since he's the first James to take the throne in England. He becomes James the first of England, and he and Parliament have some issues because James is an absolutist. He believes in this divine right of kings. But Parliament, according to English law, has the power of the purse. They are able to give money in order to fund wars. And James I has wars he's got to fight. So every time he tries to bring uh, uh, Parliament together to, to sort of figure this stuff out, like all they want to talk about is limiting the power of the monarch and all of the problems that they're having. And so then he just dissolves them and goes away and, and tries to do this. There, and, and, and part of this is religion because you do have Puritans now who are, who are showing up and now they're openly practicing um, in, uh, in uh, England. Um, they're going to be persecuted for it for a while at, at one point. Um, but Puritans want to purify the church, make it more Calvinist, less Catholic, and all of that. And they're worried that King James I, who does have Catholic leanings, is going to change the church back to a Catholic church. Well, um, he uh, dies. His son, Charles I, comes into power. Um, and that's where we move towards revolution. Because Charles I is, um, and, and notice these dates line up very nicely with the Thirty Years' War. Um, but there's an ongoing conflict. He's got, he's got a Scottish rebellion from the north. Um, there's an ongoing conflict with Spain. Um, there's all kinds of problems here. Anyway, as he calls Parliament together, they are again starting to talk about money and we won't give it to you. You've got to give us some rights and all of this. And so they give him the petition of right. Um, and the petition of right basically limits his authority to do lots of things. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's reflected in the modern American Bill of Rights. Um, and so for this long time, like, he just decides, I'm going to rule without the consent of Parliament. I'm just going to not even call them because at the time Parliament didn't meet by itself. It was called in. And through this time, he came up with, with old ways. He found creative ways to collect taxes. Um, like, for example... Um, knights. This is the, I think this is genius, right? So um, there was an old English law that knights um, uh, that knights had to pay uh, taxes when they when, when they were knighted, um, and and you know because that was the fighting force, and you know they were they, they were required to do this. Well, most of these guys aren't getting knighted at this point because you don't do that anymore. So he was charging them money. He was also charging a ship tax, which was really for the protection of the coast, but he started charging it to everyone, and they didn't like that so much. Um, but there is a religious policy going on here because he's got a Catholic queen that he marries, and there's more ritual going on, and uh, are people worried about a castration? Yes, they are. And so the Puritans, who are really not in charge, who really don't want a Catholic Reformation or just anything that's fun, end up fighting in a civil war. Um, and in the first phase, you have a real success of Parliament over the king, largely due to this guy, Oliver Cromwell, and his new model army. Um, it's, it's designed differently. They fight differently. They're very successful and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but, but the, you'll find that, the, that there is a split in Parliament between Presbyterians from Scottish from Scottish influence and and in independence, there's a, the Puritans. I mean, everybody's all over the place. Well, they decide that they're going to cut off the head of the king. So uh, yeah, we enter this phase of like there's no king, and so Cromwell takes over and 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 tries to rule through the rule of Parliament. And it becomes, it does this transition from a commonwealth where, where parliament's going to rule to a protectorate where they have, they realize you need one person in charge um, at, at, at the time. Um, because radicals, parliament, uh, everybody's arguing over what should be done and stuff like that. And so Cromwell gets himself named Lord Protector and does, well, he pretty much becomes kind of a king and does these stuff. Um, during the Civil War, you can see here these areas uh, uh, promote Parliament. Um, these areas promote Royalists. Um, so there's, there's sort of a vision there as you go along. And there he is, Oliver Cromwell. Now, that's all we have now. 
Um, but uh, Oliver Cromwell is not going to live uh, all that long. Now, he's going to do some pretty nasty things in Ireland, and he's going to be uh, a, a really controversial figure for uh, pretty much the rest of uh, English history up until today. But we are not going to get the, the full story of this until we move into our second period of history, starting with 1648. So for now, we are going to put this entire story on hold with Oliver Cromwell. Well, you can have him in office or you can have him dead. It doesn't matter. The story is going to pick up when we figure out what to do or when the English figure out what to do after he dies. So anyway, I hope that helps. I hope that makes things clearer for you. And that does it for the main points of Key Concept 1.2, The Rise of Nations. So my name is Paul Sargent. I hope this helped. And keep on watching.